Welcome to the online version of our worship service at First Christian Reformed Church of Montreal for Sunday, October 11, 2020. If you're joining us for the first time, thank you for being with us. If you'd like to find out more about us at First CRC, you can visit our website. It's at www.montrealcrc.org, and you can also visit us on Facebook. As we begin our worship together, we have a couple of suggested songs to share with you. Behold our God and made to worship. If you look in the description below this video, you'll find links to other YouTube videos that include music and words for each of these songs. God himself calls us to worship. Great God of our lives, for all that is gracious in our lives, revealing the image of Christ, for our daily food and drink, our homes and families and our friends, for minds to think and hearts to love and hands to serve, for health and strength to work and leisure to rest and play. For all valiant seekers after truth, liberty and justice, for the great mercies and promises given to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you, God. To you, O God, be praise and glory. Amen. Our God himself greets us this morning with these words taken from Jude. To those who are called, who are beloved in God the Father and kept safe for Jesus Christ, may mercy peace and love be yours in abundance. Amen. This morning we're going to be turning to the book of Exodus, the second book of the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 18, and we'll be reading the entire chapter. Before we read these words together, let's come before God in prayer. Holy Spirit, Pour out upon us wisdom and understanding, so that as we're taught by you in Holy Scripture, our hearts and minds may be open to receive all that leads to life and holiness. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Exodus 18, starting at verse 1. Now Jethro the priest of Midian and father-in-law of Moses, heard of everything God had done for Moses and for his people Israel, and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. After Moses had sent away his wife Zipporah, his father-in-law Jethro received her and her two sons. One son was named Gershom, for Moses said, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. And the other was named Eliezer, for he said, My father's God was my helper. He saved me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, together with Moses' sons and wife, came to him in the wilderness where he was camped near the mountain of God. Jethro had sent word to him, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. They greeted each other and then went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and about all the hardships they had met along the way and how the Lord had saved them. Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. He said, Praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh and who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods, for he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people, and they stood around him from morning till evening. 
When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, What is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge, while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, Because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice, and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to Him. Teach them His decrees and instructions, and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring every difficult case to you, the simple cases they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter, because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain, and all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They served as judges for the people at all times, the difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. Then Moses sent his father-in-law on his way, and Jethro returned to his own country. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this might sound like an odd thing to say, but there is at least one thing COVID-19 has done that I think is not entirely bad. A lot of us we have this tendency to idolize people who don't seem to need anybody else. If, if a problem comes up, they've got it. They're able to handle it all by themselves. You look at some of our biggest superheroes. Superman, the man of steel, faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive. Is there anything he can't do? Or Batman, the Cape Crusader, he's dark, brooding, always lurking in the shadows, operating outside the system. Even in some of the more recent takes on Sherlock Holmes, they make Sherlock out to be so incredibly brilliant that he doesn't need anyone else's help. Not really. But especially, especially with Thanksgiving coming up. What seems to be coming out more and more is that most people really don't like being alone. One of the biggest challenges a lot of people have had to face since the pandemic began is that we've not been able to, to be with other people. We have been forced to self-isolate. We have been forced to give up handshakes and hugs. We have been forced to hide our smiles behind face masks. Not long after God first created Adam, he noticed that it's not good for man to be alone. And in a very real sense, that's not just true for Adam, it's true for all of us. And that comes out in this story that we're told in Exodus chapter 18 as well. You can kind of imagine what it must have been like for Jethro, for Moses' father-in-law. You can kind of imagine how things must have looked from his point of view. When he first made the decision to head out and find Moses, he must have, he must have been at least a little apprehensive about it. Moses was Jethro's son-in-law, and Jethro still loved him. But things hadn't been the same since Moses had had this run-in with God at the burning bush. And as much as his wife Zipporah and their, their children were doing okay, they had still been through a lot. 
It still bothered Jethro that Moses hadn't been completely honest with him when he'd first left. All Moses had said was that he wanted to go back to Egypt to see if any of his people were still alive. It was only later that Jethro found out that God himself had come to Moses and that God had sent him to bring his people up out of Egypt. And then, then Moses had just about got himself killed, and not by Pharaoh, but by God himself. For whatever reason, Moses had neglected to have their first son circumcised, and if Zipporah hadn't taken matters into her own hands, that would have been it for Moses. From his own experience serving as a priest among his own people, Jethro knew, you just don't mess around with things like that. And then, not long after they had all left together, Moses had sent Zipporah and their boys back again. And that's probably when Jethro had started to realize that Moses was maybe involved in something a bit more dangerous than a family reunion. And Jethro, of course, didn't blame Moses for doing what he felt necessary to keep his family safe. But still, it had been hard on them being separated like that, not knowing when they'd see Moses again or, or even if they would ever see him again. A lot had happened since Moses had last seen his family. And as much as Zipporah and the boys were excited to see him again, Jethro was still a bit apprehensive. Jethro knew deep down he knew Moses needed to go when God had told him to go back to Egypt. Jethro knew that even after all the time he had spent in Midian, Moses had never stopped thinking about his people back in Egypt. But after everything that he had now been through, would Moses have changed it all? Would everybody be able to pick up again where they had left off? It actually came as a relief to Jethro when he finally caught sight of Moses again. Even before they had a chance to get to the Israelite camp, Moses had already gone out to greet them. And Jethro even ended up getting a kiss from Moses before Zipporah did. And then, to hear Moses talk about everything that had happened since he had left, about everything that God had done, how God had rescued his people from Egypt, it did Jethro good just to listen as Moses talked. It was obvious that he had changed after everything he had experienced, but, but from what Jethro could see, it was a change for the better. But then, the next morning, Jethro was in for a bit of a disappointment. Moses was nowhere to be seen. Jethro had figured that after the late night they had just had together, Moses would have maybe decided to sleep in, maybe spend some time catching up with Gershom and Eliezer. But Zipporah and the boys, they had no idea where Moses had gone either. It didn't take Jethro long to find him. He figured out pretty quickly that Moses was probably caught somewhere in the middle of the huge crowd gathering on the edge of the camp. Jethro carefully worked his way through the crowd so that he could see what was going on. And once he got there, he sat back and he watched as people took their turns sharing their tales of woe with Moses. He, he took one of my sheep. Her kids, they, they keep knocking my tent over. They're goats. They just keep getting into our manna. And Moses, he would patiently listen and then dispense God's wisdom as it applied in each situation. Jethro watched, and he watched, and watched. By the time the last few people left, the sun was starting to go down. And what Jethro saw, it grieved him. He had brought Zipporah and the boys back all this way after all this time so that they could be together again, so that they could be with their husband and father, so that they could be with Moses. But after not being able to see him all this time, it seemed pretty obvious to Jethro that they weren't going to see him now. 
not unless something changed. The big issue here is that you would think after all that Moses had seen and experienced of God, after, after he had seen how God had overcome Pharaoh and all his hosts and how he'd rescued his people from 400 years of slavery in Egypt, you would think that Moses would have realized that, that God has got a handle on things. God has got things under control. And yet, Yet Moses once again falls victim to this idea that, that it all depends on me. The Israelites, they need someone to tell them right from wrong, and I'm, I'm the only one who could do it. I've got to go it alone. Moses falls for that kind of thinking, and the reality is that it's dangerous. As Jethro points out, what Moses is doing here, it leads to burnout. It leads to disappointment. It ends up with other people getting let down and hurt. Now, to be fair, there are times when sometimes things happen and it really is all up to us. For instance, I read this story about another pastor once. He was out for a walk in the countryside one day when he saw this young man. A, a load of hay had fallen off the wagon that he'd been pulling and the sweat was just pouring off him as he, as he frantically tried to get all the hay back on the wagon. Now, the pastor, trying to be helpful, went up to him and said, Hey, hey, it looks like you've been working pretty hard. Why don't you sit and rest a spell, and then I'll give you a hand. The young man only paused for a split second. Sorry, but I can't. Pa won't like it. The pastor tried again. Don't be silly. You can't keep going like that all day. Even the Bible says you've got to take a break now and then. The young man insisted, sorry, but I can't stop. Pa won't like it. The pastor was getting a little bit perturbed by now. Really? Well, in that case, I'd like to have a word with this Pa of yours. If you ask me, the man sounds like a real slave, slave driver. Where is he? Well, said the young man, you can talk to him once I dig him up. He's under the hay. Like I said, the reality is that, that sometimes, sometimes there are things we've got to do and no one else can do them for us. But even so, a lot of us probably aren't as close to burning out as we might like to think. Maybe it feels sometimes like we're burning the candle at both ends. Maybe we feel like we're busy all the time. But when you, when you stop and think about it, how much of the stuff that keeps us busy actually matters? A lot of the stuff that fills our time, it, it, it really isn't that important. And we know it, especially like the time we spend binge-watching Netflix and YouTube or, or seeing what other people have been posting on social media. But still, the underlying point in all this is that it's never a good thing, especially among God's people. It's never a good thing when we get caught up thinking it's all up to me. I've got to do it all. I've got to go it alone. When church leaders and church volunteers start to feel isolated, when they start feeling overwhelmed by everything they think they've got to do, then something's really wrong. Especially when you chronically have only a few people who, who seem to do almost everything. You think of the risk that it creates for their families. If these folks don't have time to help shape the faith life of their own kids, how long do you think till those kids probably drop out of church? But then what happens too is, is when you always seem to have the same few people doing everything at church, that means that other people are not being challenged to grow in their faith. They're not being challenged to model what mature Christian service looks like for their families. And then there's a ripple effect. And after a while, where does that leave the church? What happens to its ministry? What happens to its witness? And that's why, that's why it's good for us to, to look at what Jethro does next. Because you notice that Jethro, he doesn't chastise Moses or confront him. He doesn't go after him. I came all this way with your wife and kids and this is what you do. No, 
Jethro, he waits until the end of the day. He waits until Moses has at, had at least a bit of time to sit and, and unwind. And then he simply asks him, So what exactly is it that you're doing for the people? Why do you do it this way all by yourself while everyone else stands around and waits? Explain it to me. And Jethro then actually gives Moses a chance to, to explain it all from his point of view. Jethro lets his son-in-law finish without any interruptions. Jethro listens to Moses. But then he also loves him too much to let him carry on like this, doing something that is obviously bad for him and for everybody else. Jethro respects Moses enough to tell him what you're doing. It's not good. And here's why. And Jethro doesn't simply point out what Moses and the people have been doing wrong. He humbly offers an alternative. Try this instead. Jethro acknowledges that there are some things Moses has to do, and only he can do them. Moses is the one who has been chosen to represent the people before God. Moses is the one set apart by God to serve as mediator between them. Only he can do that. But Jethro also makes it clear that doesn't mean Moses has to go it alone. Teach the people what God wants. Teach them his decrees and laws. Share that with them so that they can help share the burden with you. In the end, Jethro also acknowledges that whatever Moses chooses to do, it has to be done God's way. God has to command it. But Jethro still raises a good point, that it's really hard to see how would it glorify God to have Moses burnt out and to have everyone else around him frustrated and discontent. But if you do this, if you do this, you won't end up overwhelmed, and these other people, they will get to go home satisfied. Part of the significance of this story it highlights that tendency we often have, as another pastor has put it, to have a small view of God and a big view of ourselves. And when you think about it, that really is a form of idolatry. It is putting something else besides God at the center of our lives. It's basically what got humanity into trouble in the first place back in the Garden of Eden. And this tendency to exalt ourselves, to think we can go it alone, it really is the opposite of what love does. Love, real love, it reaches out to other people. When we truly love other people, we treat them with respect. We give them our trust. Love seeks to build others up by empowering them, by encouraging them to use and develop their God-given gifts. You look at what Jethro does, his advice to Moses, it actually helps Moses and the rest of Israel as they make this key transition. When the Israelites first got to Egypt, they were basically just a big family, but now, now they are a nation, a growing nation, and to keep growing, they'll need to have systems and structures in place, especially as they get ready for life together in the promised land. And that that is something you see throughout the history of God's people. You see it in the early church as well, how as, as the number of believers continued to grow, the way they did things had to change. There is that one key moment, for instance, when the apostles realize that they can't do it all anymore, and so the church calls the seven. They create a new position, the office of deacon. They realize that they have to adapt if the church is going to keep growing. That, that remains an ongoing need for the church. As yet another pastor put it, there is nothing holy in going about the work of the kingdom of God in an ineffective, inefficient manner. Poor administration hurts people. And that's why it's important for churches to keep challenging people to grow in their faith. It's important for ch churches to keep challenging people to step up, to take on new roles and responsibilities within the body of Christ. Church is not a spectator sport. 
It's important for those of us in positions of responsibility, those of us who are elders or deacons or, or Sunday school teachers or sound booth techs or whatever, it's important that we keep an eye out for capable, godly people who are able to take on new roles in the church. We all want to see the church grow, and so we need to always be thinking ahead. We can't just settle for what seems to be working now. We need to be ready for when God brings new people to us. There is one other reason why it's not good for us to go it along, and it has to do with our witness. Looking back at the story of Moses and Jethro, you notice that what impressed Jethro the most was not watching Moses trying to tackle all of Israel's problems single-handedly. The fact is that he couldn't. But what catches Jethro's attention, what makes him rejoice, is hearing Moses talk about what God has done. The church has one Savior, and it's not any of us. It's Jesus. He is the one who came to save us. He is the one who gave his life on the cross to set us free from slavery to sin and death. He is the one who rose again so that we could have new life in him. And what people really need to experience is him, not us. What people need to hear is us talk about him and what he has done for us. Amen. As we continue our time together, let's spend a few moments in silent reflection. We have a few questions to help guide your thoughts. Do you ever feel tempted to try and go it alone? What are some things we can do to avoid falling into that temptation? What are some things we could do together as a church family to help encourage each other to grow in our faith and to use our gifts to serve each other? Since many of us are planning to celebrate Thanksgiving this weekend, let's take some time to come before God once again in a Thanksgiving prayer. Give thanks to the Lord, who is good. God's love is everlasting. Come, let us praise God joyfully. Let us come to God with thanksgiving. For the good world, for things great and small, beautiful and awesome, for seen and unseen splendors. Thank you, God. For human life, for talking and moving and thinking together, for common hopes and hardships shared from birth until our dying. Thank you, God. For work to do and strength to work, for the comradeship of labor, for exchanges of good humor and encouragement. Thank you, God. For marriage, for the mystery and joy of flesh made one, for mutual forgiveness and burdens shared, for secrets kept in love, thank you, God. For family, for living together and eating together, for family amusements and family pleasures, thank you, God. For children, for their energy and curiosity, for their brave play and startling frankness, for their sudden sympathies. Thank you, God. For the young, for their high hopes, for their irreverence toward worn-out values, for their search for freedom, for their solemn vows. Thank you, God. 
for growing up and growing old, for wisdom deepened by experience, for rest and leisure, for time made precious by its passing. Thank you, God, for your help in times of doubt and sorrow, for healing our diseases, for preserving us in temptation and danger. Thank you, God. For the church into which we have been called, for the good news we receive by word and sacrament, for our life together in the Lord, we praise you, God. For your Holy Spirit, who guides our steps and brings us gifts of faith and love, who prays in us and prompts our grateful worship, we praise you, God. For your Son, Jesus Christ, who lived and died and lives again for our salvation, for our hope in him, for the joy of serving him, we thank and praise you, eternal God, for all your goodness to us. Give thanks to the Lord, who is good. God's love is everlasting. Amen. Giving is part of our worship. It's part of how we show the love of God by reaching out to other people. Now, if you are just joining us online, there is no expectation that you have to give anything. But if you are part of the church family at First CRC, this is one way that we can give thanks to God and help in the work of His church together. Our offerings this week are for our own ministries here at First CRC and for the West Island Mission a non-profit organization that provides well-balanced, high-quality food assistance and other related aid to those less fortunate living in the West Island of Montreal. For more information on how to give, especially if you want to give online, you can contact us by going to our church website or by visiting our Facebook page. God sends us out once again with his blessing. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Help the suffering. Honor all. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. And all God's people said, Amen. As we finish our time of worship together, we share with you a couple more suggested songs. Come thou fount of every blessing and give thanks. Again, if you look in the description below this video, you'll find links to other YouTube videos that include words and music for each of these songs. You can also follow along with these two songs if you have the Lift Up Your Hearts hymn book. Until next time, God bless. <laughs>